All right. Well, thanks for the introduction to your invitation to speak here. So my name is Luke Bourne. I am the co-founder and chief scientist of Zealous Analytics. Uh, before that, I spent a few years with the Sacramento Kings. Uh, and prior to that, I worked in uh, soccer uh, with AS Roma and a couple other clubs along the way. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about a project that I did a couple of years ago with a student of mine at Harvard. His, his name is Andy Miller. Um, he's now uh, a data scientist at um, Apple. So this project is a little bit different than the work I, I'm typically known for, which is around player valuation and some stuff around sports science and so on. This is really sort of a, a nuts and bolts project that um, may be less flashy for a fan or for, a, uh, for media consumption, but uh, very useful from a team perspective. So the, the project today is really thinking about how do we go about organizing NBA possessions or in general basketball possessions, right? The idea here, hey, can we find a way to sort of query really similar offensive sets historically, right? When, when I was at the Kings, I spent three years at, the, at Sacramento Kings. Our video staff was really good. They would take up a lot of video from our upcoming opponents, from our own games. But in the end, just because of the time required, they would, were never able to take up you know, every single NBA game. And if you think, hey, I want to not just get NBA games, I want to get G League games, I want to get Euro League games, I want to get international games, etc. It becomes really hard to think about, hey, um, how do we actually tag up every possession of every basketball game? So the idea here is to sort of be able to find similar offensive sets or be able to sort of query a large set of basketball possessions and be able to pull back the set that contains sort of similar semantic structure, similar uh, sets as we think about it. Um, and then that obviously allows you to explore team and player uh, tendencies in a much richer way. You can say things like, not just like who's the best, um, uh, which team best generates corner threes, but you can say, how do they generate those corner threes? Or you can say, which player is the best player in the pick and roll? You can say things like, which players in the best pick and roll on this particular offensive set? So it just allows you to get a lot more detailed uh, and nuance around how a value is created on basketball court. So, you know, our basic idea here is, is to, can we organize a database of hundreds of thousands of NBA possessions? And th th this slide deck was from when uh, tracking data primarily is in the NBA, but of course now uh, things are changing slowly and, and we're getting starting to get this data uh, in college, the G League uh, and internationally as well. So this allows us to say things like, you know, how do the Rockets create all their corner threes? Again, these slides are a bit dated, so you're going to see some slightly dated play references, but how, what's the success rate of the Warriors weave? Who's the better option on the weave? Clay Thompson or Steph Curry, et cetera, et cetera, right? And it basically, it allows us to answer questions that are contextualized by the, the player, the set that's being run. All right, so I, I know the audience uh, here is going to be sort of a mixed bag of people who deal with the sort of X's and O's of basketball and people that don't. So um apologize if this is, is overly simplistic for some but i want to sort of dive a little bit into uh, what's going on in, the, in this set here so this is a few years back um spurs against the wizards and what you're seeing here is the spurs hammer set and it's a it's a fairly straightforward play but if, if you watch this as sort of a naive basketball fan right you can imagine someone who doesn't live basketball day in day out they would probably just notice two things one that sort of ginobili drove to the basket and two that danny green in the corner here cut the corner three uh, and, and, and took this corner three, right? But when you really dive in, you see there's a lot more nuance that, that's going on here. For example, if you watch, um, the most important thing probably here is if you watch Danny Green's defender, right? Who, who's Rashford Butler, watch. So down in the uh, bottom of the screen here, uh, Danny Green who takes the corner three. His, the guy guarding him, right, Butler, if, if you watch what happens, Tiago Splitter is gonna set a screen right there. And so really what makes this play is not just Ginobili driving to the basket and kicking it out. It's this sort of weak side cut, Danny Green cutting into the corner while the big, in this case, Tiger Splitter sets the screen on Danny Green's man. And that creates the opening for the corner three, right? And this is sort of known as the Spurs hammer set. So I think, you know, as a coach or as someone who, who deals with the X's and O's of basketball all the time, uh, you can sort of spot this in the very first pass. But I think the casual basketball fan probably doesn't uh, clue in that this has happened. And just to sort of, you know, show that this isn't a coincidence, here's a, a, a same play um, just, a, just a few days later, if I recall. So very similar, still Ginobili uh, kicking out for green. In this case, the defender's different, and it's um, Tim Duncan setting the screen. So you'll see uh, green cut to the weak side, and then pin down screen right there. All right, so nice moving screen from Duncan. 
All right. So, so again, the, the idea is to say, okay, can we imagine you have that, that's sort of our notion of a possession, right? Let's say we have this for every single possession of an NBA season or multiple NBA seasons or G League or college or international data. How do we go about sort of finding all the Spurs hammer sets or all of a different type of set? All right, so that's really our aim here. But before we sort of dive into that, I want to give a, a brief aside and sort of talk about how we actually solve this problem. And that's to leverage a bunch of work that exists out there in text analysis. So it turns out, and I, I'm, for this audience, I'm not really going to dive into the technical detail, but the important point here is that we have really good methods that that were that have existed for sort of 10 plus years that allow us to feed in a large corpus or a large set of, of articles, like newspaper articles, for example. And these methods will naturally sort of cluster these um, these articles into into articles of similar content. So, for example, here's a handful of articles. Um, you know, Trump healthcare, um, Jeff Sessions, Rory McIlroy playing golf with Trump, Colin Kaepernick protests, and then at the bottom, some stuff about the Warriors and, and March Madness. And there are really, again, there are really good methods out there where you could feed in these articles and they would tell you, hey, these first four are about politics, the bottom four are about sports, and the middle two are actually a bit of both, right? You know, Rory McIlroy playing golf with Trump, et cetera. So there are really nice methods to, to be able to do this, where you feed in a massive amount of of articles or documents, and it'll tell you sort of which ones are which of, of similar content. And so we're going to essentially use these, I, the, these methods and these ideas applied to basketball, right? So we can think of in some sense a possession as like a document. And the words within that document are, are being the actions that are happening on the court. And so what we want to do is essentially figure out a way to turn a possession into a document. All right, so you know that essentially what we think about, hey, we have all these basketball possessions. How do we go about thinking about a basketball possession as a document, and how do we turn it into something that these text methods can can understand? Right, one way to do this it wouldn't, wouldn't be terribly efficient, but would be to sort of take all these possessions and hand annotate them. Right, so that might look like this. So this is the, the Spurs hammer set, where if you sort of had a um, um, someone who knew the game inside and out, you could feed them every single possession. You could sort of crowdsource this to say, okay, um, this, this Spurs hammer set is a cut to the left wing with the give and go, a drive to, uh, from the left wing to the basket. There's a weak side cut to the corner. There's this pin down screen that happens. You can imagine that, that someone who, a coach of the game could watch this possession and write it out as a document, right? And if you did this for the hundreds of thousands of possessions, of course, you could then feed that into this text analysis literature right? or these text analysis models. But of course, this is actually harder than the original problem, right? Um, because the whole point was that we didn't want to have someone have to manually watch hundreds of thousands of possessions. We want the computer to do it for us. So this is kind of the idea, right? We want to go from a play to some, some, some notion of a document so that we can use this text literature, but we don't want to do it manually. All right. So we don't want to do it manually, but what we do have is player tracking data. And again, this data has been widely available in the NBA now for, for quite a few years, and it's slowly becoming um, available in, in other leagues as well. So what we want to do is we want to be able to take this tracking data. This is sort of an animation of that same play. You can see the Ginobili give and go right there to Patty Mills, kicks it up to Danny Green. You can see the screen of Thiago Splitter on Butler, etc. So we want to be able to take that, that this data and sort of tr translate it into something that looks like a document so we can use this th these models from text analysis. Okay, so how are we going to do this? There's really two pieces here, and, and I'll, I'll talk about each one of them um, separately. The first is thinking about sort of the individual actions on the court. So here, here's an example of a, uh, an individual possession from Harrison Barnes. Okay, so, so what I've shown on the top left is uh, sort of the movement pattern of, of um, Harrison Barnes on that particular play. So he starts sort of up the elbow, uh, cuts out to the, to the wing for uh, sort of the perimeter, drives back sort of baseline cut to the corner, and then ends up at sort of the opposite elbow. So if you looked at this, you, you could sort of easily take Harrison Barnes's movement and say, okay, every time that Barnes stops moving, in, in other words, every time he stands still, we're gonna sort of slice it. And these are these red dots. So when you look at this top left, Plot here, you can think of the gray dots as sort of movement. And then every time you see a red dot, that's sort of when Harrison Barnes has stopped on that particular possession. So, you know, he moved from zero to one and then stopped and then from one to two and then stopped and then two to three, et cetera. Right? 
And what I show on the top right here is his speed over time. So you can see here, those red dots are essentially when, when he's stopped moving, when he's standing still, right? Now, what we can do is sort of take, take this movement and, and slice it up at each time um, Barnes stops. And that will allow us to essentially for every possession say, okay, we're gonna look at each player and as, as it sort of progresses through the course of the possession and we're gonna sort of slice at the moment that they, um, that they stopped moving. And so I'm just throwing three players here, but you can imagine that what we get then is sort of this uh, trajectory segment. So it's like, you know, player one is doing something and then he stops moving and then player, you know, player two does something and stops moving. And you sort of can imagine you end up with all these different little trajectory chunks or little trajectory segments uh, throughout the course of a possession. All right. So what we want to do now is take all these segments, right? So, so think about we've, we've taken 100,000 plus NBA possessions. We've taken all, we're just going to focus on offensive players for the moment, but we've taken all five offensive players. We've segmented their movement into these little segment, these little sort of trajectory segments. And now what we want to do is we want to find similar ones. We want to cluster them, essentially to turn them into something that's, that's sort of intuitive and sort of group them together. And so what we do is we actually are going to take all of these trajectories and we're going to, you know, when you take this 100,000 plus NBA possessions, you end up with about four and a half million of these segments. And we're actually going to group them together. So we're going to sort of put them into clusters. Right? And, and what we want to do is sort of say, find, you know, be able to say this is a baseline cut, or this is sort of a movement from the, the elbow to the wing and be able to sort of group them in that way. I won't go into the technical details here, but functionally what we're doing is saying, hey, we have all these functions through time. These cool spinning plots here are actually showing the play or these segments progressing through time. So time starts at the top and then sort of works its way to the bottom here. And you can see what the gray lines are, are actual player movements from the data. And then the, the red line is what is our cluster center. So these are sort of like the, the centroid of these, these movement patterns. And interestingly on the left, actually, you can see an error in the tracking data. So one of these, se one of these trajectory segments actually sort of jumps over and then jumps back. Uh, that's pretty common in, in player tracking data, but you can see here that the method sort of still handles it fairly well. And so this actually is a fair bit of uh, computational um, resources required. Luckily, we had Harvard supercomputers to handle this. But in the end here, what we've done is we've taken these four and a half million little segments of movement. You know, so Harrison Barnes on that possession that we showed earlier sort of created seven of these segments. And you can imagine if you have five offensive players, 100,000 plus possessions you end up with these four and a half million. And we've, we're gonna group them into 250 of these clusters. And that's essentially what this process is here. All right, so now what we've done is we're able to sort of find similar segments. Again, we haven't found similar possessions yet, but at least we're able to sort of group segments of these movement patterns together. And so what we're showing here is two of those segments against, or two of those clusters. So again, we have 250 of these clusters and these are just two of them. But in, in this case, we actually get these really nice baseline cuts, one from left to right and the other from right to left. Now, it's worth noting here that the model itself does not encode this symmetry. But interestingly enough, it sort of falls out, right? A baseline cut is like a really common action and it, and it recognizes it. So just to sort of give more detail on what's happening here, each one of these individual dots here is an actual player running across the court, right? One of these dots is like James Harden making a baseline cut. Um, and, and we're thinned it down. There's actually a lot more data than this, but, but each one of these individual dots is an individual player. And then the larger dots being traced behind is sort of the cluster center. That's sort of the, the canonical shape of that group of, of actions. All right, so we don't just have two, two of these. We have a lot more of them. Here's eight more. And so these are just sort of different uh, trajectory segments sort of as we're clustering different types of movement that, that players make. And so our, our aim here is basically to sort of categorize the types of actions that players take on the court, okay? And of course, we don't have eight of them, right? We have 250 of them. This, these, this is just eight of them being visualized at once. So remember, we have sort of 250 of these different unique movement types. All right, so now we're, we've sort of taken each individual player's movement and we've sort of categorized each segment of their movement. And now we wanna think about how the players work together so that we can get actually the end goal, which is to again, group together similar possessions. So, so flipping back to this way, we had represented the possession over time. We had taken each player's movement and we had essentially sliced it at, the, at every time when the player stops, right? But, and, and then we went through this clustering step and essentially what that's allowed us to do is to, to, to group together similar movements. So we can now say things like, okay, at the start of the possession, player one is doing the purple action, which is in the bottom right. 
So that's sort of like a cut from the, the one wing to the, to the corner. And at the same time, player two and player three are doing this red action. Okay, and then a little bit into the possession, player three switches from the red action to the blue action. Okay, and again, these, these, this is just illustrative, but you sort of get the idea that we're able to say at any given point in time throughout the possession, um, what players are doing what. So for example, at the very end of this possession, we have player one doing the blue action, player two doing the red action, player three doing the green action. And again, these colors are just these sort of 250 clusters. So we have 250 of these sort of colors. And so we're able at any point in the possession to say, what, uh, which of these 250 actions or trajectory segments or sort of colors that the, are these players doing and then sort of say um, what are being done by the, the, the different groups of players. All right, so that's that sort of has got us to this point. Now, how do we actually, remember, we're trying to sort of turn this thing into a document, right? So how do, how do we get there? All right, one thing we could do is, is, is to take the individual colors that we see in a possession. And again, I'm sort of using colors and clusters um, interchangeably, but you can think of these colors as sort of these, these, these movement segments, right? So the purple one here, you can see it on the bottom and the red one and the green one. And of course we have 250 of these colors or segments. So one thing we could do is create a document that's just like the, it literally just the list of colors, right? So this possession here could be colored. The document could literally be purple, green, blue, red, or maybe it's the sort of series, you know, purple, purple, red, red, blue, green, and you could sort of lay it out in a, in a particular way. Well, it turns out in these text models, the order of the words actually doesn't matter. So really, we would just think of it as sort of like a, a bag of words or a bag of colors in this case. So that's one way we could represent this, this, um, this possession. But the thing is, just like a text analysis, right? If you look at the text analysis literature, it, it turns out, for example, if you think through um, what it would mean to have the word house and the word white within your document, that's a very different thing than if you have the bigram white house within your document, right? Having those words separate, uh, white and house means something very different than if you get the white house together, right? One would sort of probably be about house design and, and those kinds of things. The other is clearly about politics. And so similarly in a basketball possession, what defines a possession is not necessarily the individual actions, but how players are sort of doing these things collaboratively at the same time. So what we might do then is say, okay, our, our document then is instead of being sort of the list of, of colors that appear or the list of movements that appear in this action or in this or in this possession, we're gonna look at the pairs of concurrent actions. So for example, at the start of this possession, player one is doing purple and player two is doing the red action. So we would have a word that would be sort of purple red. And then player two is doing red and player three is doing red. So we might have a word that's red, red. And then player three at some point along this possession switches to the blue action. So then we'd have another word, which is red, blue. And so you can imagine that, you know, we have 250 of these cl colors and you're going to, you're sort of scanning through the whole possession and you're grouping together um, all the sort of pairs of concurrent actions, right? And so for example, you know, this would essentially look like, you know, one of these movements would be a drive to, Ginobili drive to the basket. The other would be weak side cut to the corner. And the, the fact that those things are happening together at the same time really matters. And at the same time, you'd see that weak side cut to the corner with the sort of pin down screen. And so these things happening sort of concurrently really matters in thinking about what the semantic content of the possession actually is. Okay, so now we've sort of built, we're able to take the tracking data and turn each possession into a document. And now what we want to do is actually explore it. So, so again, like we, we essentially can take these documents, now we've fed it into this text um, analysis literature. And what, what it's done now is it sort of spat out every possession and it, it allows us to now group really similar possessions together. So what I'm going to do now is say, I'm going to take a whole bunch of possessions, a couple thousand possessions, and I'm going to plot them in sort of this abstract space. And each dot is going to represent an individual possession. And the basic idea here is the closer together two dots are in the space, the more similar the possessions are. And the farther apart they are, the more different they are. OK, so he, he, here's the sort of every dot here represents an individual play. And so let's zoom in on two that are really close. And they both happen to be Golden State uh, possessions from a few years back. OK, so again, they sort of, we, we we're able to sort of cluster together every play. And we can sort of say, hey, two that are really close together in this abstract space, they're more similar from in terms of their content. So let's look at two that are really close together. And let's see, is it doing what we think it should be doing, which is finding similar content, similar plays. So he, here's what those plays look like. So for those of you, the, the um, sort of X's and, X's and O's aficionados here, we'll see this is the Warriors weave. You see the sort of weaving pattern back and forth at, at the top of the arc. And again, you see the exact same thing here. 
So interestingly enough, both of these possessions end fairly differently, right? In the play-by-play, -play, the top one would say, I'll, I'll replay this here quickly. The top one would say um, Barbosa three-point shot, and the bottom one would say Clay Thompson two-point shot, but you don't really get the fact that both of these plays were actually the exact same um, underlying set. All right, so the model census has done what we thought, right? We, we'd say, hey, we want it to be able to find similar plays. And when we look at two of these things that it says are really similar, yes, they're the exact same play. All right, so here, here's what it looks like with the tracking data. In both cases, you see the weave action at the top of the arc. In one case, Clay Thompson steps over the line, takes a shot. In the other case, Barbosa takes a three. All right, I'll give you one more example before I wrap up here. This is sort of looking at, at this is from a few seasons ago, but looking at uh, all the corner threes generated uh, by a handful of teams. This is the Warriors and the Rockets and the Spurs. And we've colored them by the individual teams. And essentially, again, the same as before, each one of these dots represents a given possession. And the closer they are in the space, the sort of more similar those possessions they are, are the farther apart they are, the, the less similar they are. So what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in on one of these little clusters, this, this red one at the top here. And we're going to look at a couple of those plays. And this essentially, it's a way of saying, hey, how do these teams generate their corner threes? And we can look at these sets that are really similar and sort of understand the sets that they're using to generate um, these threes. OK, so this in both these cases, the, uh, this is the Rockets from a few years back. So um, again, for those who are X's and O's can probably identify this play right away. But for the rest of you all, I'll sort of walk through what's going on here. So in both cases, you see the, the point guard give the ball away and then run down into the basket. Probably what you see right away in both cases is James Harden um, with a baseline cut. And I'll replay this here. So the, the first thing you notice, yeah, is probably that James Harden baseline cut from bottom left here, the screen across. The, across. Um, in one case, in the top one, it's not actually Harden that gets the three, it's, it's Ariza. And in the bottom case, um, it, it's Harden. The next thing I'll get you to notice when I replay this is the point guard who's actually um, giving the ball away on, on the left play here, it's uh, Terry, and on the right, it's uh, Prigioni. They're gonna, they're, when they give away the ball, essentially they're running down and setting a screen on Harden's man. So in the bottom left case, it's Macklemore who actually gets around the screen. Right. And on the bottom right, which is gonna play in a second here, you'll see that it's Prigioni is gonna set it on Monta Alice and actually it's a really nice screen. Monta Alice gets totally lost. So James Harden basically ends up with a wide open three because of that screen from Prigioni. So again, it's saying, hey, this is one of the ways that the Rockets created their corner threes. A, a handoff from the point guard drives, comes in under the basket, sets a screen on James Harden's man so James Harden can make that cut. And the one on the left didn't quite turn out his plan because uh, Macklemore got around the screen. On the bottom one, Prigioni sets this nice screen on Monta Ellis. Screen definitely works. And Harden ends up with a wide open three. All right, here it is just showing in, in, in the case of uh, the, what the sort of underlying tracking data looks like. And in both cases, you can see it kind of ends differently because on the left case, it sort of breaks down because Macklemore gets around the screen. But in the right case, um, you know, Harden ends up this wide open three. All right, so in, in conclusion, you know, this is this is kind of an interesting um, project to me because it's not something where we're talking about, you know, ranking the best players in the league or finding the best players at X, Y, or Z. It's really sort of a fundamental task that's all of this sort of mathematical infrastructure is really designed to, to help a team solve a particular problem, which is sort of extract similar offensive sets. And so, you know, should you have the tracking data within your organization, these types of models would allow you to streamline potentially a lot of the things that your video staff are doing now and potentially make them a lot more robust and, and, and scalable. Um, so, you know, this is one project amongst, amongst many that we've done, but you can sort of get the idea of how this allows you to answer questions within your organization that you probably couldn't have before. Like, you know, how, do, how does a given team create their corner threes or how successful are they on a particular set or when they run this set, who's the most likely to be this, you know, run, uh, be in a particular role. All right, and I'll stop right there. Thanks.